All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 18th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I want to talk about real Christianity, genuine Christianity, as opposed to um, natural Christianity, shall we say. Or as uh, someone once put it, Augustine, 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 the city of God versus the city of man, but not in the way he put it. The church that God built and is building, rather than the church that man built and is building. So let's begin with Jesus and John chapter 3. Lay a biblical foundation here, since this is thinking biblically. What else can I do? <clears throat> Of course, this is a conversation with the uh, the well-known rabbi and uh, Sanhedrin member, Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or literally born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot perceive the kingdom of God. don't have eyes to see it. You're blind. You cannot see it. Why? He goes down farther and says, uh, talks about being born of the Spirit, and says, uh, Nicodemus, well, how, how can these things be? He says, the Spirit blows where he wills. As the wind blows where it wills, and you don't you cannot see it, but or know where it's coming from or where it's going to, but you can see the signs of it moving. So it is with the Spirit also. We cannot directly see the kingdom of God with our eyes. We cannot see the Holy Spirit. We cannot see God with our eyes, but we can perceive his actions and his movement. If you're born again, if you're not, you have no eyes to see the things of the Spirit because the Spirit of God is not in you. That's a promise of the new covenant that only comes into effect after Jesus is crucified, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and pours out this promise of the Holy Spirit upon the church in Acts chapter 2. So that before that, no one had the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Jesus said, he has been with you, but he will be in you. He will abide within you forever. So let's go to another scripture here. Let's see, where am I now? First Corinthians chapter two, verse 14. But the natural man, man born of Adam, man born only once, man not born a second time, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. Let me check that word there. Okay, that's not what I thought it might be. Does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor does he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged by no man, no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. But then he goes down in the next chapter. Of course, there's no chapter division in the original text. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So a newborn Christian, born again, is still 
carnal, still dominated by the flesh. That's what it means to grow up in Christ. You become less dominated. You become more mature. You are no longer a child, but you learn to discern the truth, to discern, to judge things spiritually, to judge things biblically. So, again, it's spiritual. It's not carnal. There are many churches that are simply carnal. They call themselves New Testament churches. Churches of Christ are basically completely carnal, unborn, not born again at all. They cannot see the kingdom of God because they don't have the gospel. They don't believe the gospel. They believe they're Pelagians. They believe there's five things that you must do to be saved. You do. Hear the gospel. Believe the gospel. Repent of your sins which is not a biblical expression at all. Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't say baptized into Christ. It says baptized for the purpose of having your sins forgiven, a thing you do or have done to you, and live the Christian life. <laughs> oh, that's an easy one, right? Yeah. So uh, as uh, one elder told me when I sort of confronted him visiting a church, <laughs> I shouldn't take my wife when I do things like that. I said, so, so what you're saying is every time we sin, we're lost until we ask God to forgive us, right? Said, yeah. So if you're driving down the interstate and you have a sudden uh, encounter with a Mack truck going the wrong way and suddenly you find yourself completely dead, um, and but you had sinned like, not loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength while you were traveling down the interstate. Are you lost? <laughs> Pelagians are in deep trouble. If your salvation depends on you, you're toast. You need somebody better than you to save yourself. You need God. You need Christ. He's the only one that can do it. See, they don't look to Christ on the cross. They, don't, they know nothing of imputed righteousness. They know nothing about being born again. In fact, in many of these churches, the very mention of the word Holy Spirit is almost enough to get you kicked out of the building. Rationalists, follower, Campbellites, followers of Alexander Campbell, who was strongly influenced by John Locke, the, uh, the deist, philosopher that had a lot of impl uh, input into the United States, the ideas of democracy and the rights of man and all these things. Uh, his parents were Puritans. He was an apostate. He denied the God of the Bible. So good one to follow if you're going to start a Christian denomination. By the way, the Churches of Christ Christian Church, they started out as a reaction against sectarianism, but became the most sectarian of all cults. <laughs> Yes, if you don't have the right sign in front of your building, it has to say Church of Christ or perhaps Christian Church. Anything else makes you a church of the devil. You've got a piano in the church for the non-instrumentals. You're all going to hell. Everybody that goes to church in that building that goes there is going to hell because they have the only thing they get from Calvinism is the uh, um, the regulative principle. Because the Bible doesn't tell you to have a piano. Therefore, you're going to hell because you're breaking the law by adding something to worship. Not an instrumental church of the Christ. How do I know that? I went down and asked the minister. When I was pastoring a church that was related to the, sort of related to that movement, different branch. Uh, not the Campbellites. So I went down, there was a non-instrumental church and an instrumental church, both in the same little tiny town, and a Methodist church, and our Christian church, which was a different thing. And so they told me what they believed down there. So I, I don't believe that. They can't really mean that. They're not being serious or they're exaggerating. So I went down there, found the pastor in the, the church building and asked him. He said, yeah, that's basically what we teach. I said, so, but I see you've got microphones and everything else here. And this is <laughs> at a new building. The Bible doesn't say you can use those either. 
I said, well, it has to do with worship, instruments and worship. But they used it in the Psalms. David had instruments prescribed for the temple. They used musical instruments in the worship of the temple. Said, yeah, but that's Old Testament. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter that the New Testament doesn't say anything about it. That's enough to get it condemned and send you to hell because it, the New Testament didn't authorize it. It doesn't have to authorize it. That's, that's the uh, Calvinist regulative principle gone awry. In other words, if God doesn't command it, you can't do it. Well, no. If it involves loving God in a reasonable way, that's what God commands you to do. I would say instrumental music, if it's used properly in a church, is involved in proper worship because it regulates the worship. It gives us a common melody and a common key and a common tempo to sing to. If you ever been in a church that was completely non-instrumental and untrained in singing that way, it is chaos. I was in a, in a Baptist church down the Mexican border like that, and people were literally singing their own songs to their own melodies and everything else. It was like Pentecostalism, speaking, singing in tongues, practically. It was just chaos. Well, God doesn't like chaos. It, from the very beginning, from creation, God doesn't like chaos. He says human beings were supposed to, to uh, exercise dominion, uh, put order in creation, to order creation for the glory of God. But what can you say? If you're a natural man, you can't understand the things of the Spirit. So you take things in a natural, literal, foolish, childish way because you can't understand the realities of the spiritual world of God because God is spirit. Huh, that's churches of Christ. And the worst of them is the non-instrumental. Really, I... I, I pray to God that there's some out there that are better. There might be. Maybe. It's like, I've actually heard reports of Catholic priests preaching the gospel. Now, I don't know if the man who reported it to me actually knew what the gospel was either, though. So, I tried to quiz him on that. and but it's possible. I mean, the, the Reformers were all Catholic priests. <sighs> so spiritual things are spiritually understood. You have to be born again to understand or perceive spiritual things to, in order to perceive the kingdom of God. Now, on earth, in this age, the kingdom of God on earth is the church, the true church, the born-again church, the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, not the thing that calls itself the church the biggest of which is a Roman Catholic thing. Uh, it is calls itself the one true church, but it is not at all the church. There may be Christians scattered here and there in it, but that's about all. And you look at Christians on the Internet, especially the conservative ones that are upset with their Antichrist Pope, they are all concerned about the institution of the church because that's what they look to for their salvation. My father-in-law, I think um, that's what he looked to. He looked to the church as an institution and the sacraments of the church as his way to salvation and purgatory. Tried to tell him, you don't have to go there. You can't pay for your own sins. Christ did that for you. You know. All right, so here we have, you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. And Paul is taking, saying the same thing here, is that the natural man cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot perceive the things of the Spirit because he's natural. He's of Adam. He's still dead in trespasses and sins. The Spirit of God is not in him. He's, he doesn't have the mind of Christ. He doesn't have a new spirit, um, though he has no eyes to see. Therefore, when the world thinks of the church, they think of the, what they can see with their eyes. Uh, many Christians think of what they can see with their eyes. 
some of the strange doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church, well, that's that's why all the idols are there, too, why there's an idol of Christ and an idol of Mary and all these things, because it is what a carnal, a fleshly, unregenerate man can see. It's religion of the flesh, because there's no other possibility. That's why it's all about symbols and smells and bells and building construction, the cathedrals, the stained glass, to make things look spiritual because they can't see the kingdom of God, which has nothing to do with those things. And the transubstantiation of the, of the, the mass, the bread and the wine, become literally the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Uh, identi- physically, I mean, the substance is changed. <laughs> They're saying is really, really, really means is. It just doesn't look like it is. Because they, t- they cannot see anything beyond that. So they come up with these strange doctrines to, to, to justify that the, the bread literally is the physical body of Jesus and his soul and his divinity and his blood. It's like, but nothing is, I mean, you couldn't possibly determine any changes scientifically at all. But in their philosophy, which has come from Aristotle, is that, well, it's substance. The reality of it, not the not the real reality, but the other reality, is Christ. That's not it's not unable to understand the Word of God spiritually. Uh, Martin Luther was unable to understand it too, and they were also uh, the Latin translation was compounding the error in some ways. But here you you have to in order to understand Christianity is one hundred percent spiritual. It's not physical. It's spiritual. Baptism is a spiritual act. It's not a physical act. The physical is just there for our benefits. So there's something we can see. So something that you can know something was done. The Lord's Supper, the same way. The, the, the bread and the wine is, it has to do with the Passover. But uh, physical substance, a material thing, cannot transmit the Spirit of God, or the grace of God. God cannot does not dwell in physical things. He dwells in he's spirit. Spirit is not matter, cannot be changed into matter. Even the rock that followed Israel, the rock was Christ. The spiritual rock, it may appear physical, but it's not. It wasn't. It was Christ. A real rock does not pour water. A boulder, a big boulder, does not pour out water. No, it's not. That's not what boulders do. So you have to have eyes that can see, and you have to be born again to do that. The things that we speak also speak not in words of man's wisdom, teaches, not the, in the words which man's wisdom teaches, in other words, not in philosophy, not in Aristotelian metaphysics, for example, which is an important example, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. You can't get this at a seminary because there are no seminaries where the Holy Spirit is on staff. He doesn't serve institutions. These things that we, uh, so, so the, the Spirit which is from God, these things we know, uh, that we might know those things that are freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words of man's, uh, that which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. In other words, but discernment, spiritual understanding. You understand the things of God, which are spiritual, Spiritually, you cannot perceive, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you've been born of the Spirit. All right. Where else? Okay, now. There's a lot, there's, especially when I was growing up, I mean, I think they've pretty much gone away from the uh, unite, well, no, they haven't. (laughs) Unite all religions into one. Unite all Christians must be physically united under one institution. That's Rome's dream. And get all the Protestants back. Get the the Orthodox back under the skirt of the Pope. 
Um, no, <laughs> it's not going to happen uh, because born again Christians will not have it. Nor will we submit ourselves to a to a uh, a a vicar of God who calls himself a Christian prince. Talk about a bad idea. Such a historically ignorance. You'd think a person that was had a degree, a PhD, he's pretty young, in uh, political science. Go to university, lose your mind. You can't think after they pumped you full of their nonsense. You'll, be, you'll become woke. Well, yes, I must atone for my, the sins of my ancestors. I guess I got to go hang myself like Judas. That would be bad. You can't, you're not responsible. The Bible is very clear that the son shall not be put to death for the sins of his father. Do Christians believe the Bible? I don't think so. They would rather listen to the world and serve the world. In fact, that's part of their message, go and serve the world. That's what I heard among the Nazarenes. And calling down Jesus to come and serve us, Lord Jesus. Really? They didn't see spiritually into it. It had to do with Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. He was teaching them a lesson. Jesus did not come to serve us. He came to save us. Ay, caramba. That was... And here I always thought pretty highly of the Nazarenes until I understood their doctrine. I'm not talking about individual Nazarenes. And there, there's some out there I know that are saved. But... Yikes, it's pretty bad as far as the doctrine that goes on there. You look at the denominational stuff coming down now, it's all woke. It is. They have given up on, on John Wesley's sinless perfectionism. Obviously, it's hard to, to hold to that in the, re light, in the light of reality. You know, Okay, let's see the sinlessly perfect people. Let us do a close examination of them and see if they're sinlessly perfect. How long would that take? Oh, five minutes maybe. <laughs> No, I can see some sin there. Uh, but they're going woke, and they're going uh, seeker-sensitive and Wick War Rick Warnish, too. Well, Rick Warnish, of course, if you're going to be a seeker-sensitive church, you have to be woke. You have to go with the flow, as or as Rick Warren said. You perceive some movement in culture, and that, that of course, is the Holy Spirit doing that, right? because there's a movement, a trend, a, a fad in culture. So you're going to take your surfboard, Southern California, and hop that wave and ride that wave to build your seeker-sensitive, crossless, Christless church. Yep, that's how it works. It, it, you might put a lot of people in the building, but you're not going to put anybody in heaven that way. So here, chapter 17 of John. So the, the unity of the—what's the unity? And this has to do with the, the unity that always exists among Christians in spite of all the barriers that men erect, men and women erect, to separate Christians inside the church itself. All these denominations are unlawful in the sight of God. They're a violation of the law of Christ. They're a violation of the will of Christ. They're a violation of loving your neighbor as yourself and loving God with all your heart. They're a violation of everything. But the world is full of them, including the greatest sect of all, the Roman Catholic Church. They're a sect because they do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, as John says in Second John. They do not abide in that. They built their own stuff, their own institution, not his church. And they've enslaved multitudes well over a billion, maybe a billion and a half, to a false Babylonian Christianity. But are Protestants that much different? Not really. Not really. There is those who have been born of the Spirit of God, whom God has saved, but everybody else is not in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what organization you belong to. It doesn't matter that you have a checklist of doctrines you subscribe to. That is not what being born again is. Of course, if you are born again, you will subscribe to God's Word because you love God. You love your Savior. 
and you seek to serve him out of love. John 17, verse 14. Of course, this is the Lord's great high priest. It's a great uh, uh, priestly prayer to the Father for us. He says in verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. We are not of the world, brothers and sisters, and the world hates us because of that. Because we belong to Christ and not to the world, the world hates us. Do not be surprised. Do not think that anything you will do will change that. They will hate you if you truly belong to Christ. If you don't want to be hated by the world, well, you have to leave Christ behind. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you, that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Set them apart to yourself by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. I heard a, uh, a preacher on, on YouTube, uh, sort of related to the theonomy thing, I suspect, uh, culture wars, uh, Christ, uh, Christian nationalism kind of stuff that, as I said, is not really Christian and nationalism. It's something else. Advocating that Christians should leave blue states and move to red states in order to establish a Christian nation, I guess. I suppose Texas would be a reasonable thing. Let's take over Texas, kick all the other people out, and establish a Christian nation there. Wouldn't be the first time Texas was an independent nation. In fact, you could start smaller, The recreate the, the, the uh, Republic of the Rio Grande. There was actually, a rep for a few a year or two, there was a, a separate nation along the Rio Grande River, simply because it was cut off from everything else, except by sea up the river, which was a difficult thing to do in a steamboat. But, uh, yeah, there's actually a republic along the river there. It, it, barriers, impossible uh, prickly pear and cat's claw deserts on both sides. You can't, could not go through there by horse or on foot. You will die, which many people coming out of Mexico try it and they die. They die out in that stuff. It's, don't even, please, people... Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. Uh, I don't want you to die out there of snake bite or being shredded and dying from uh, dehydration and and uh, the sun. It'll kill you dead so fast. Don't even think about it. It's not worth it. There's nothing in America worth it. The only thing you can find of value is in Christ. Don't come to America to find Christ. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not not likely to find him here. Not very easily. So you find him wherever you are. Just call upon his name. Call upon the name of Christ to save you, to save you from your sins and justify you through faith in him. He'll meet you where you are. Don't come someplace else. It's not worth it. You don't want to see your bones bleaching out in the desert. Oh, God. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so also I sent them into the world. As I was starting to say, is why should we, why should we leave where God has put us and go to someplace else to get away from the world? We've been sent out into the world, into the dark world. We are the light of the world. Why should I leave this stinking state called Illinois uh, with the 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 governor and all the evil going on here in, in the higher realms and flee to Texas? Well, they got just as much sin down in Texas as they got in Illinois. Probably more. It's a bigger state. What's the purpose? We're not called to hide behind walls. What are we, Saul and the armies of Israel cowering on the ridge 
while Goliath taunts us? We're supposed to be Davids. Jesus was a descendant of David. Take them on. Charge them. In the name of the Lord. Not in your own name. You'll lose. Goliath will do a number on you if you go at him in your own name. No. We are the light of God in this place. Wherever you are, if you're born again, Christ is in you, and you are the presence of Christ there. You are a temple of God. You're the only light the world has. Why would you leave them in the dark? For your own pleasure? That's not serving Christ. You're to lay down your life just like he laid down his. <sighs> Foolish Christians. These people on the Internet, I don't know. It's not a good thing in a lot of ways. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As I sent, as you sent me into the world, so also I sent them into the world. Into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. I've set myself apart to the Father to accomplish his work. That very day, he was going to accomplish the work he came to do. He was going to die on that cross. That very day, this is the night before that. This is the same day in Jewish time. That they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, his disciples alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one. This is, you know, the, the message. Oh, that you'll all be one, as uh, that the world may believe. The world may be believe. Uh, if the church has to be one, one visible unity, that the world may believe. That's not what it says at all. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. And they also may be one in us, so that we may be united with each other spiritually. That they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. We have to be united in him. He is our unity. Christ himself is our unity. And the Father is our unity. We are his people. It has nothing to do with visible unity. We are the kingdom of God on earth. The world cannot see us because they do not have the eyes to see. You must be born again to perceive the church. Unregenerate people look for a visible organizational unity because they are spiritually blind. And the glory that you gave me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have, uh, and have loved them as you have loved me. That's our unity. It's God. It's Christ. God in us, Christ in us, we in him. We have a, a unity far beyond any silly earthly organizational thing, like Roman Catholicism, just nonsense. Of course, their unity is the Pope. Antichrist says your unity. Wow, wonderful. And this guy really is one. So we're talking about New Testament Christianity here. Okay, let's go back and... Talk about some of the problems. First John chapter 2, again. Little children, this is the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Antichristos means the, the, the Greek prefix anti, 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 means both against and it means substitute. It can be used either way. And somebody like the vicar of Christ, the word vicar or vicarius, vicarius Christi, is uh, translated into Greek as antichristos. 
Antichristos, the very title that the popes took for themselves, substitute. A vicar is a substitute for. So vicarious uh, Christi, it's like uh, Christ died a, vic a vicarious of, of, of death, a substitutionary death. Vicarious Christi means substitute for Christ. But the Pope is against Christ because he doesn't say the same things Christ says. He puts his own will above the will of God. He, did, he fulfill, fulfills what Paul says about the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, depending on which Bible you read. It's the same thing. Different word, but it means the same thing. He said, but now many antichrists have come. So if you're, you're locked into this dispensational idea, this popular Christian fiction idea of a, a unitary antichrist that rules over the world, uh, that's not what the Bible describes at all. The man of sin could refer to an individual. But more likely, it refers, in the Greek, I mean, it can work either way, but more likely, based on the context and what John says here, there's many antichrists. It means a, a category of people, a type of people, like the children of Adam, that kind of people, as opposed to the children of God. Because the children of Adam, by nature, exalt themselves over God. That's called sin. Every time you sin, Deliberately, you're putting your will above the will of God. You're exalting yourself above God. You say, my will, not your will. That's what Adam did. Adam exalted himself over God. Adam knew what God said, don't eat of that tree. Adam decided, and the Bible says he was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't. Adam chose to violate what he knew to be the will of God. He exalted himself over God chose his will, his will rather than God's will. Of course, that's what Satan is. They went out from us, but they were not of us. So these antichrists come from inside the church, these ones that, that John is describing. He's the only one that uses the term antichrist. Paul doesn't use that term. He says man of sin, uh, assuming it's the same thing. But it's the same thing, if the, especially if you think of it as a category, the children of Adam, uh, the children of destruction, uh, the, the, the children of, what is it, the children, what is, how does Paul put it, another place, uh, the children of disobedience. I think that's in Ephesians. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they were of us, they would have continued with us. So when people come out, out go out of the church, uh, now we're going to talk about this a little bit, going out of the church because they don't want to abide in the doctrine of Christ, the true doctrine of Christ. They don't want to abide in, the, in what's spoken of about Christ in the Old Testament prophets and in the Gospels and in the New Testament, uh, the, the, uh, the epistles. They don't want to abide in that. They want to take away or add to that. So they go out from the fellowship of abiding in God's word into other things, into man's word, man's opinions. And they make following a man an antichristos, like the pope or the, the, uh, the Christian prince that Mr. Steel, the, uh, Stephen the Wolf wants to put up over us, the, the uh, vicar of God. Oh, that guy's nuts. <laughs> Obviously not born again. But there's many people that are starting to follow that idea because fear. They look at what's happening in the world and they want something, they want somebody to protect them. They want to, to withdraw from the world into a safe place. They're basically like these, these snowflakes. So we're talking about these people that want this kind of stuff, the Christian nationalism that's not really Christian nationalism, but it's a, a theocracy in that case, or a theonomy, uh, and want uh, uh, their own independent little country with the walls around it, big walls around it, where it's a safe place for us. It's a safe place for Christians. And we got to get our teddy bears. You're talking about, a few years ago, talking about college campuses, how the students were all a bunch of snowflakes because they couldn't take any heat at all. They, they'd, oh, you triggered me. I'm having an emotional reaction. I need to go 
find somebody and comfort me and give me a teddy bear and, and go to a nice padded room and wallow in my self-pity. <laughs> that's, that's what these guys are doing. And gals that want their own little safe little Christian nation. Well, it wouldn't turn out like you imagine. You really want a Calvinist Geneva only on steroids? Do you really want to, to have to worship the vicar of God? Who is an absolute autocrat? So you really want to build the kingdom of Antichrist for a safe space? <laughs> Not, I don't think that's a very good plan. If they went out from us because they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, with the teaching of the apostles and Jesus and the Old Testament prophecies about Christ. That's a, that is the doctrine of Christ. That is the teaching of Christ. All that. All that's in the Bible about Christ. Christ is the focus. If, you're, if you are looking at the Bible focused on something other than Jesus Christ, you are misusing the Word of God. They went out that they might be made manifest, in other words, visible, that none of them were of us. So when they leave the teaching of Christ, as John says in 2 John, they demonstrate they're not of God. They don't abide in Christ. They don't abide in the apostolic teaching of Christ in particular. They go out. I'm not talking about the teaching of men. The, te the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. That teaching. The te that, that ended with, the, with the, the ending of the apostles. Yes, these modern things called apostles, unless you're referring to missionaries, <laughs> no, they're not apostles. And they demonstrate their antichrist because they don't abide in the doctrine of Christ. They went out from that, from the church, showing and, and exalted themselves as prophets and apostles. And their words demonstrate they don't abide in that teaching. They're made manifest. They made themselves manifest to us that they're not of us. They don't love the Lord Jesus. They love themselves. They have no eyes to see. They are blind. If a blind man follows a blind man, they will both fall into a ditch. Leave them alone. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all, are all things. That is, as a need to know, the Holy Spirit will teach you everything you need to know. That it, the anointing is the Holy Spirit. That is a term tremendously misused by the apostle, uh, apostle and post prophets and charismatic and Pentecostal movements. Okay, let's... Go for more scripture. We can't uh, scripture here. Second John uh, chapter. Well, it's only got one chapter. Verse seven. Again, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. He's talking about a particular heresy here. Uh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you may not lose what we have accomplished. In other words, that they may not depart from the gospel delivered unto them. This is a uh, house church. Does it say where it is? No, it doesn't. To the, uh, to the chosen lady and her children. Uh, this is probably a house church. And often wealthier Christians, this might be a, a wealthy widow, for example, because it doesn't mention her husband, possibly a husband's a non-believer, more likely a widow. Uh, because they had a larger house, they would. there were no church buildings. All churches were done in houses. And it was uh, not, uh, it was just a place to meet. I'll go into that a little bit more. But we're dealing here with the, really the physical reality of, or the spiritual reality of what the church, New Testament church is. 
So you have to abide in the teaching of the apostles, the, the faith delivered once for all. And that includes the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah, where it talks about the coming of Christ. Isaiah chapter 53, talking about the atonement of Christ. Um, I can't remember which psalm that is right off the top of my head, where, is it Psalm 21? Uh, something like that. Where it, David prophesies Christ's crucifixion. Um, many places in the Old Testament to speak of Christ. That is, you know, the, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles, the New Testament particularly, and the prophets, that's Old Testament prophets. We have no writings from New Testament prophets because uh, they're not, they don't have the authority to teach new doctrine. That's why uh, the prophets and apostles today are invalid because we already have the faith delivered once for all unto the saints in the New Testament. It's conceivable that under certain circumstances where that the written Word of God was not written, it was not available, that you could have supernatural manifestations of prophecy or teaching or that kind of thing, but it wouldn't be establishing any new doctrine. It would simply be speaking forth what the Holy Spirit has already spoken forth in the Scriptures. So it's conceivable. You could have a gift of tongues, for example, uh, where uh, to people that don't have any written uh, Scriptures, and you don't know their language, it's possible that the Holy Spirit could use you to preach the gospel to them, but it would be the gospel. It wouldn't be any other message. The Holy Spirit never reveals any message other than that which is delivered once for all unto the saints in the New Testament, by, and particularly by the apostles in the New Testament. Because it's been delivered, we don't need any, you know, other than in situations where the Holy Spirit chooses to do that, the, the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement, and of course especially the prophets and apostles movement, are utterly false. They're not from God. They don't preach the message of God. They don't abide in the teaching of Christ. That's not what they're about. If anyone goes too far or transgresses in, say, the New King James or King James, and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not remain in it, abide, like live, dwell in it, he does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. And that's why here, and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting particip participates in his evil deeds. Okay. I th that's why one of the reasons I think this is a house church, because... You don't want to embrace a false teacher that's bringing false doctrine into the church. Into a private home, well, I wouldn't, you know, I would not invite Jehovah's Witnesses into my house unless they wanted to hear the gospel. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want my, my neighbors to see me inviting them into the house. It would be bad. For my neighbors. But I think in this case, it's actually talking about a, because the church is always, the Christians always met in houses, unless they're, you know, prior to the persecution where they couldn't meet, in the, uh, they, they did meet in the temple occasionally, but once the persecution began, they couldn't do that. So it was always house to house. And the teachers, the apostles and the other teachers would actually travel. So it was a network. The church, the New Testament church is a network. It is not an organization. It's a network united by the teaching, united by the Christ himself, the Spirit of Christ. It is, it is uh, like it's a body, the body of Christ, and we'll get to that perhaps. So let's get to the church again itself. Ephesians chapter 4, the unity of the church, what we all hold together, the true church the spiritual church that is the church of Jesus Christ, not a human organization. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you or beg you to walk worthy of the, of the calling with which you have been called, 
with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Long suffering, that's a good example of bearing in love. Because it's it's not simply patience. It is you putting up with things because you love someone. It is grounded in love. Long suffering is always connected with love. Uh, you suffer long, but you suffer in love because you know, suffer other people uh, because of the love that God has given us for one another. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is, again, the Spirit is Christ himself, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, one God. This is our unity of the true church. We are perfectly united in him. Organizations are of man. They're not of God. For there is one body, the body of Christ, one church, and one Spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's the baptism into Christ, of which water baptism is related to. But the, ba the true baptism, it is a, a visible sign of the spiritual reality that a person has been united to Christ and is pledging his allegiance are, and testifying that Christ has saved him. It's a testimony to the church more than anything else. But it, it is beyond that. It's like the Lord's Supper. There's a spiritual reality associated with it. Uh, Paul says that with the heart one believes unto justification, unto righteousness. Uh, but with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. Baptism always, believer's baptism always even infant baptism involves a confession of faith. In, in, the, in the case of infants, the parents, and if there's godparents, they confess the faith on behalf of the child, because the child is not of age to confess it himself. There's a validity to that. But even then, those like in denominations that do that, they all practice confirmation. So when the child comes of an age, uh, junior high, uh, usually... Somewhere in there, uh, biblically, it'd be when they're 12 years old for a boy, maybe 13 for a girl, they, would, they themselves would confess their faith. But the Holy Spirit doesn't always work like that, does he? We can't program the Holy Spirit. I didn't come to that faith, that kind of faith, truly saving faith, until I was 21, right around 21 years, right around my 21st birthday. And I guess you could say God gave me the best possible birthday present ever. It was like, wow. <laughs> giving, giving himself as a gift. How can you beat that? <laughs> he belongs to me and I belong to him. <laughs> that, that's uh, the unity we all have, born again. We all have that in Christ. We are... We are God's, including the Father's. We are His, and He is ours. That unity that Jesus was talking about in chapter 17 of John, we, we, we should read that once in a while. So, uh, one God and Father over all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then he talks about uh, each one of us has been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Okay, um, here he mentions apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But there's other lists. I think in Romans, I think there's, uh, I think in Romans chapter 12, there's a more extensive left list. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's see, is there anything else? Spiritual gifts. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to talk off. And then they, they met. See here, for example, this is Acts 2.46. So this is right after Pentecost. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So the Christians were meeting together generally in the temple when they could, but always from house to house. And again, in, uh, in um, Acts 5.42 and 
Let's see here. Another example, uh, Saul made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off women, uh, men and women, uh, to prison that was probably as they were meeting together as the church. That's how persecution usually does it. They don't go to your private house when you're alone. They get you as a group. Uh, and so we, we continue through these different things. We can see, again, uh, often when the church is described, it meets in the houses. Okay, so I want to talk about this thing. First of all, the spiritual reality and then a little bit of the form. So our unity is in Christ. Christ is Christianity. He is everything. He is our salvation. He is our Lord. He's our, he's our, our life. He's our, our, uh, our joy, our peace, our strength. Everything that we have, all the promises of God are ours in Jesus Christ. That is the important thing. And the faith delivered once for all to the saints, the, 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 the doctrine of Christ, as John says, we have to abide in that. Anybody that does not remain in that and goes too far, goes beyond that, uh, they are um, not serving Christ. If they go and if they if they abide outside and they try to draw others out into a false system of doctrine or a false agenda, uh, like uh, saving America from you know uh, fixing America so it doesn't you know culture wars, they are not serving Christ and they should be. We're not listening to you. Go away. <laughs> Go away. Uh, repent. Come back when, back when you can. You can come back when you repent and come to your senses. We, where Christ is in the right place in your life. But a lot of people like that aren't born again. They cannot see the kingdom of God because it's spiritual, and they have no no eyes to see it. They're of the flesh. They're natural. Nothing but natural men uh, and women. So that's uh, they cannot worship God in spirit and truth. You must be born again to do that. You cannot behold God. Uh, you, you cannot communicate with God, if truly, if you're not born again, because God is spirit, and you're dead if you're not born again. You can cry out to God to save you. That's about it. And that's out of self-interest. You can't love your neighbor, your brother or sister as yourself if you're not born again. You simply can't. You don't have the spiritual capacity. You're dead in trespasses and sins. You're in Adam. You have to be in Christ. So uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is the form of the church. So in, in the beginning and in the New Testament, they always met in houses, usually. Occasionally in the temple. And usually it was in a, the house of a relatively wealthy Christian because it was bigger, <laughs> Typical houses, I mean, I have a small house, but in those in the Middle East, like in Jerusalem, a typical house would have been smaller than my house. And my house is like 800 square feet with an addition on it. It's small. The coal miner's house originally, I think, was three rooms. That was it. You don't have a bathroom. That, uh, you have an outhouse in the back that's not there anymore, but it would have originally been an outhouse. And you have a a well, and you draw water from the well, and you bring it in. The, they had a uh, where the kitchen is. That was actually an addition. So they probably had a, a parlor slash kitchen slash bedroom, and then a, who knows what? Not much. Three rooms. About nineteen ten. Coal mining area. Not particularly well built either although it was built largely out of oak. So it's... <sighs> Nevertheless, so it wouldn't be suitable for, I mean, I Thanksgiving dinner, we probably get, what, five, 10, 12 people in the house. And it's pretty crowded. I mean, I could do a house church here. It would be inconvenient. Uh, I could do it if I had a good reason to do it. Um, ideally, one person wouldn't be 
So we're going to talk about the form of the church. So you got a spiritual reality. You have to be born again. If you're not born again, uh, you, you, can, you, you can still be carnal. You don't have to be perfect. And new believers carnal. They're, they're still dominated by the flesh. And that's why one of the reasons we need to gather together is because they need to be around uh, more mature believers so they can sort of see what they should be or, or you know, see what direction they should be moving in. Not that you're going to find a, a Christian that's perfect. Christ is perfect. But it helps to be around others and others that can see how we're, what we're doing and maybe try to steer us in the right direction gently, unless you need to get a... Sometimes somebody needs to give you a slap across the head, you know. But usually people just need to be encouraged and pointed in the right direction, as others who are more mature and have gone through the same thing themselves can uh, help them do that and say, well, you know, I don't think you're doing this quite right, or, or you're displaying some attitudes that really aren't Christ-like. Uh, here's maybe what you want to think about doing, how you can overcome those, teaching them how to walk by faith, not trying to get them to uh, try to walk by works, because that always fails, and that will discourage new believers. If you teach them the wrong thing, uh, walking by works, uh, putting repenting of your sins. You've got to to beat your flesh and no, you have to walk by faith. You overcome by faith. Faith is our victory. Faith in the promises of God that he will sanctify you. Christ has made unto us what? Righteousness and sanctification and redemption and uh, wisdom. You 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 receive all these things through believing in Christ and his promises. You can't generate it out of yourself. You can't just get it by learning about it. You have to walk in the promises of God. You can't sanctify yourself. You can't do it. Your flesh won't do it. You have to overcome by faith. Faith is our victory. Uh, faith, is, faith is the means of grace. The, truly the only means of grace. Everything that we receive from God is received through faith. That's it. Whatever is associated, if it's baptism or the Lord's Supper or everything else, it's all associated with faith. It's, if their faith isn't present, it doesn't do you any good. Uh, so, but uh, the, the form of the early church was house church. And there's certain things about that. It's not mandatory. Uh, there was a house church movement some time ago, but they they f fell upon the rocks because they were all about the form of the church, and it was a system of legalism. If you don't do church this way, you're sinning and yada, yada, yada. You've got to do the Lord's Supper this way. It's got to be part of a common meal. And they made it all into law. And, of course, they died because the law kills. All these movements, these legalistic movements, they always die. And it manifests sin all over the place because that's that's what the law does. It energizes sin, too. Rebellion against the law, it just energizes it. So it gives power to it. So it's, it doesn't work. Uh, but the there are a lot of advantages, especially as we move into a position of, if, if your hope is in Donald Trump, forget it. Donald Trump could very easily become a persecutor of the church, just like anybody else. Because, he's, you know, is, is Donald Trump born again? He manifests way too much self-centered egoism to be born again. Uh, it's all about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is about Donald Trump. And if somebody does not worship Donald Trump, uh, you know, like he says, well, I think you're wrong, he is, uh, he'll turn on you. He's demonstrated that. If somebody says, well, we're not going to vote for you, evangelicals, if some of them have said, well, because we don't think uh, you really represent Christ or something like that. And, uh, he gets got nasty on anybody that doesn't approve of him. So uh, if you're not born again, you still are a child of the devil. And it doesn't matter whether what what you are outside, Republican or Democrat, they can all of them will do it. One of the worst dictators in American history was Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican president. 
Uh, yeah, he was a dictator. Suppressed freedom of speech, first draft of the United States, involuntarily throwing people into the military and into combat to almost certain death. And there was riots and everything else about that, but he didn't care. He had his idol, and that was the Union. So he was not a Christian at all, never confessed Christ. No evidence he was ever a Christian. He was an atheist, or a deist at best. So don't put your hope in men. Especially, I don't trust unregenerate men at all. They're still controlled by Satan. And when it comes to governments, the governments of this world, Satan controls them. They're not part of the kingdom of God. Government, in general, is ordained by God to keep some kind of a lid on sin through punishment, the fear of punishment. They, they bear the sword to punish wickedness. And that doesn't mean they all necessarily do that well. As we've seen, government authority can be misused like every other thing that comes from God. And they do that. But it's not ordained for the church. Christ is our government. He's our king. The governments of this world are ordained by God to, to, uh, to be a minister of justice in a sinful and wicked world. But there, there are sinners in government. That they're all sinners, practically, in government. We shouldn't be confused about that, nor put our hope in that. That it's not, not meant for us anyway. Christ is our protection. So as far as the, uh, the, the so we talked a little bit about the spiritual reality of the church is composed of all those who are Christians. Uh, uh, the denominational stuff is sinful just plain sinful. It's a plain violation of, of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So it's uh, in our unity. We do have unity. Born again Christians all have unity because we are of one spirit. We are of one faith. We are of one Christ, one God. That exists. We have to look at it that way. All this denominational stuff is a result of sin, one way or the other. Either people fleeing from corruption or because they're following corrupt teachers. In the world, world, of course, the sinful world, Christian world, like the mainline and Roman Catholics and such, they want visible unity because they want the power. Denominational mergers are always about power. Just look at them. They're always about power. They're not about Christ. What is denomin organizations of men made by man has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. It's all man-made stuff. It's like the Tower of Babel. And it's usually rooted in fear. The Tower of Babel was rooted in fear, lest the flood come again. God had promised there would not be another flood. Why did they build the, Babel, the tower? In case the water rose. <laughs> At least that's an impossible explanation for it. And because they wanted, to be, they wanted unity. God didn't want unity for the world. He wanted the nations divided. He said, go and fill all the world. You know, they... they they didn't want to. They wanted to, to hold, stay together and make a name for themselves. Well, what is denominationalism? It is a, a denomination means of, D of, a name. Nomination, a, 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 to denominate is a name, of a name. So that's what they want. They want an identity for themselves. They don't want a common identity. They want a particular thing for themselves. They all want to be the one true church. And there's a whole lot of one true churches out there. Guess what? None of them are the one true church because you can't see the one true church because it's invisible. It's always spiritual. In this age, it will not be visible until Christ returns and we are glorified together with him and we descend to earth with him. Then the church will be visible, very visible, just as Christ is visible then. Uh, so our, our, we don't want to try to create a synthetic unity that is unequally yoking with unbelievers, because that's what it is. 
But the New Testament church met in houses, uh, not to make legalism out of form, because the house church movement crashed on that. But there are so many advantages to that. If we consider the church as a network, which it was, it was a network. It had no hierarchical construction to it. There were churches that they referred to, it's like Jerusalem, uh, but there was no system of hierarchy, no regional divisions, nothing like that. You had, uh, the scripture talks about, say, the church in Corinth, or the church in Ephesus, or the church in Jerusalem. It never uses churches in regard to a location like that, a city. It uses churches in regard to, say, the churches of Asia Minor. So in a region, it'll refer to churches. But, of course, there's a whole lot of cities there. Within the city, they, it was not a single building. It was houses, and they'd meet from house to house. And you'd have the apostles and teachers and others that circulated about this. So you had a network of believers and a network of, uh, and the house churches were very fluid, plastic. So it, it wasn't, a, uh, you wouldn't necessarily meet in one house all the time or with one group of people all the time. It was much like how the Amish do things. Uh, they meet in houses. In fact, they build their houses to accommodate the size of the congregations, which are, I think, around 50 or maybe a little more what you could accommodate in a large house. And so they build their houses with removable or movable partitions so they can open the thing up. Uh, and they don't meet in one house all the time. They don't build church buildings. They'll build a school building, but they don't build church buildings. So what they do is they meet every other week as their particular local body, but that's also networked with all the other little bodies around them. And every other, so they only meet every other week, and in the in between weeks, they'll, uh, the congregation will visit one of the neighboring uh, congregations, and so they'll go there and meet together with them. So they're they're not a separate thing; they are integrated with these others, although they meet together more often than they do with the others. So some there's like probably three or four other right around them. And then what they do is they have a like a wagon that is equipped with the, the they keep the chairs and the eating utensils and the tableware and everything, cooking utensils they need for a large group. And they just move the wagon to every, uh, I think one, one family might host the location for a month and then it moves on to another one so one family's not burdened with that uh, at, at their location for too long. So it, it just shifts. And there's a lot of good things about that, especially when you have uh, house churches. One of the problems they've experienced is in neighborhoods where you have a large number of vehicles there on a regular basis, uh, impeding other people's parking, perhaps singing loud on Sunday mornings when other people are sleeping. Uh, so what happens is sometimes the neighbors start complaining, and that's when the city gets in and says, well, you're not zoned for a church and all this stuff. And So like if you're just having a party or something, it's not a regular weekly event. So that if you actually shift the location around, you don't attract as much attention and trouble nor do you create an excess, excess burden on one family or one person hosting you all the time. So there, there's a lot of good things about that, avoiding uh, bothering the neighbors. I mean, you might not like, like that too if somebody was doing that next to you. Consider the interests of others also. So that is, uh, in, a, in a small church, you don't have to have a lot of organization. You don't have to have a pastor. Uh, you don't have to have uh, a deacon because everybody knows. Everybody knows. And if you're loosely networked simply through relationships and everything else with everybody else in the community, 
in the city. Uh, then the word can get around if you can't handle something. You know, if there's a, a serious emergency and that small group there is not able to, say, if somebody's house burns down, is not able to meet all the needs, then other churches are aware of it, are made aware of it too, and, you know, it, it expands out. Plus, you had traveling pastors and teachers and whatever in the, in the church. This is one church. This whole city represents one church biblically. And you show you had traveling teachers that go through these, going from house to house, from little congregation to little congregation. Again, these are not fixed things, but plastic, just a network. What they usually call in mega churches nowadays, they'll almost always have small churches, how, uh, small groups, because a thousand people is not a church. It's not. You don't know. It's, it's ridiculous. So that's how it was in the New Testament. You study, search for yourself, and see how it how it was set up. It wasn't. A, it just how it happened. The Holy Spirit did it this way. And those who try to make that as a mandatory form are missing the point. It, but the practicality of it, the practicality of not having people going into debt, perhaps even to the world, to build a building, why? That's, that's not even used most of the time. Why do we spend you know, a, 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 a relatively small church nowadays might cost a million dollars to build? I mean, if you're say 200 people, 150 people, at least a half a million dollars. And then you got to meet all the building codes and everything. It gets more and more expensive all the time. And then there's some things if a pandemic comes along and they say, well, you can only meet 10 people at a time. Big deal. We never have more than 10 people. See, that would have, I was hoping that the pandemic would bring out more of a New Testament form of Christianity. Where every, you know, it's not just this little group. That's one of the problems with the house churches, too. But rather, it's the community of, it's the church of the city, and everybody can move freely move around to different things, and there's teachers traveling around. So it is unified in that, it's especially unified in the Holy Spirit. And a lot of things like communion works a lot better in a small group than it does in a church where you go up to the railing uh, uh, pew by pew, or you pass it around. and I mean, you can do much more with it. You can all share in that together. And you break the bread and take the cup and pass it around with 10 people, nothing about that. I mean, it's just normal. And even have it par as part of a meal, if you're careful, to not have people come that are hungry. If you're going to do that, do the meal first, but then everybody's wants to take a nap, but uh, the, it has a lot of advantages to it, and we're going to be forced into that if things continue to go south in the United States. And this is not unusual. Uh, regular church, real churches in China are house churches, not state-approved churches. You, you, even then, you run the risk of them bulldozing your house, just like what Israel is doing in Gaza uh, to people they don't like. They bulldoze their entire house. Uh, but, and by the way, in Israel, they persecute Christians, too. You're not allowed to preach the gospel there. No. No. You're, uh, so we're going to, as, as things get closer and closer to the, the return of the Lord, uh, we'll be more and more hated, as Jesus said. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake for being true Christians because we hold to him and the culture is going the other way. So it's going to happen, we, but we're still the light of the world. Is God going to remove the light of the world because we don't want to suffer at all? I don't think so. He who gave his only begotten son to suffer for us that we might be saved. Is he going to pull the witnesses of Jesus out of the world? until he's done with it? I mean, until the only thing coming is judgment? No. As long as he's still in the business of saving people, we're going to be here. So, uh, but as we're going to, we're going to be forced, 
because we didn't learn from COVID. We're going to be forced into this. We might as well start thinking about it now and maybe start moving in that direction now. There's an awful lot of Christians out there now that are already outside of the institutional church for a lot of reasons, a lot of good reasons, not just because they're rebellious. Maybe they ought to be rebelling against that man in the pulpit. Because the institutional church is not built by Jesus Christ. I mean, the, the, that it's a man-made thing. That doesn't mean you can't have a church with a building and some organization that's not that it's not the true church at all. That's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, it's just that as things get bigger, it requires more organization, more structure, and it becomes farther and farther away from a a New Testament church where everybody's part of it. That's the other thing in a house church rather than one man doing everything, which is really unbiblical and burns pastors out. Even a good pastor is going to burn out because all the responsibility is thrown on him. Uh, it, 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 when somebody's in the hospital, the church members should be visiting, not one man. And, and the more you, more you got to in one thing, the more centralized things have to be. So, But the Holy Spirit, it's the scriptures, Paul writes in Corinth about the gifting that God gives us and all kinds of gifts. Some of those aren't operative today, as I made a point out and why. But most of those gifts are operative. God has gifted us, especially with the gift of love for one another, which is the most important of all gifts. As Paul says, if you have that, you know, who cares about the rest of the stuff? Loving one another, loving God and loving one another, those are the, 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 the important gifts. And the church, the people in the church have to express that, uh, meet together in order to encourage one another, to express our love for one another, to, to build one another up. And we're gifted differently for the unity of the body. God has not gifted us all with the same gift, but gifted us individually with separate gifts so that we need one another. We need one another. And that's not expressed in the churches today. It's just not. You'll have a handful, maybe, and uh, a, perform a pastor, and everybody else is a spectator. You're not ministering to one another. You don't really have the opportunity, which means there's something wrong with the way we do church. If we can't do that, and that will frustrate people. And we have to learn how to express God-given love for one another. And hiring somebody to do it for you is not the way to do it. That's not what the Bible tells us to do. The purpose of an elder or overseer is to, that may often teach, but he's not the exclusive teacher. And he also, the purpose of the elder, and these could travel around too. It wouldn't necessarily have to have several elders for one small group. But to uh, it would be better if they travel around. And so you have a variety of teachings, not one guy that's focused on one thing. Uh, so there's God if, talking about the real church and real teaching. But it, it, it's the diversity of gifts is for the purpose of binding us together out of need for each other. We can't just solve the whole thing. We can't meet all the needs. And pastors that try burn themselves out. They, 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 God did not intend for one man to do all the ministry. He's supposed to equip the, uh, the elder is supposed to equip the body, or a pastor is supposed to equip the body of Christ for the work of the ministry. He doesn't do it all. It's not his responsibility to go to the hospital and visit everybody that, that's sick. Uh, that he, He's expected to do it. It's, 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 it's crazy. It's everybody's job. Some people are, are gifted for prayer. That's their thing. They give me a prayer list and I'll spend two hours every night praying for everybody on this list. Other people say, Thy, thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's enough. Um, 
people are gifted differently by God, and together we form the body of Christ. We are all members, as Paul said. Can the eye say to the, to the hand, I have no need of you? Of course not. But we don't function that way. Persecution will make us function that way, because there will be no other way. It would be good if we could do it without having to experience that. I don't think so. But we need to be thinking about this and, and how we can do things. For example, with the pandemic, this would have been, we should have learned how to do this. We should have sought what God says. We should have opened Scripture, but we didn't. And the heroes became people that were rebels against the government like MacArthur and Doug Wilson and his clan up in Moscow, Idaho, these people and, and the others up in Canada, they were considered heroes for not following Christ. God has provided the model. He has shown us what to do, and it all comes down to love one another. That is Christ's great commandment. And we have to abide in Christ in order to abide in his love and to walk in love toward one another. That is real Christianity. That is biblical New Testament Christianity. And I wish we were practicing that.